Hey everyone, John Lordson here uh, in suburbia, but uh, kind of reminiscing about how finding Minnesota really is my favorite part of the job and covering stories in all four corners of the state for you guys. Thank you for all the emails and tips on different Finding Minnesota ideas. Back in May, we went to Murray County and visited a nearly 100 year old barn that has quite a story. Uh, check out how the Breezy Point Barn went from housing cattle and buffalo to hosting wedding guests and bar customers. Very small towns, very homey area. Everybody's a family. So that's, that's the big part of what I love around here. Teresa Daniels also loves the farm feel of Murray County which is fitting because she spends most of her days working in a barn. This was a dairy barn at one point. It was, yes. It was a, a cattle barn. There was animals in here, dirt floor, cattle stalls. The building served that purpose for nearly 80 years before it pulled up stakes and moved cross county. The barn actually relocated here in 1999. It was loaded onto a flatbed trailer and then slowly moved seven miles to this location. You're kind of in the middle of nowhere, right? We are, yes. Is that we the are, appeal behind we this We are too? fields as far as the eye can see. But the move and the years were starting to take a toll. This is great though, beautiful. That's when Teresa's dad, Terry, and his crew got an idea. We just seen that it was gonna go backwards. It just wasn't gonna get fixed up and it wasn't gonna get done and we had the resources to do it. So they decided to turn the barn into a bar and entertainment venue called Breezy Point Tavern, replacing the old tavern that sat here. They gave it a makeover, all while keeping much of its century-old character intact. It took them about half a year to repurpose this rural relic. Like these chandeliers here, my wife insisted we have a little glamour with the barn just for weddings and stuff, and that was her idea to have them. Upstairs, weddings and receptions have become popular. So have winter pool tournaments. We bring five tables up. I've got a gate here I can take off and the friend comes over and we lift them up and come in with five tables here and then we have three downstairs. Downstairs, bar and restaurant customers have replaced the cattle and even the buffalo that once roamed the barn. Outside, the Breezy Bar is the Breezy Barnyard. That's what they call their campground that opens May 1st. The idea behind all of this is to prove that people will drive anywhere for a good time, even to the middle of nowhere. It's very, very much not regulars you have here. It's friends and new friends. I think it's it's turned out better than I ever thought. Well, we all know that Minnesotans love to explore and now they have a chance to step into caves that haven't been stepped in in nearly half a century. Here's why the Jordan Brewery Cavern is worth a trip. That's when it kind of sparked in my mind that it was a gorgeous building that kind of needed some work behind it. Three years ago, Jim Craman Jr. opened Strains of the Earth on Broadway Street in Jordan. He chose this beautiful limestone location for his THC dispensary, retail store, and wellness retreat. Truly, Strains of the Earth is really broken down to helping people. But it's safe to say the building's purpose nowadays is far different than it was 160 years ago. 1863, uh, yeah, this was, uh, this was a brewery, Jordan's Brewery. And it's about to be that again, sort of. Okay. Got a little hobbit door, you get through that and now you're in the caves. This tunnel goes about 40 feet back and then it opens up into our cave. This is really cool. Yeah, we've got a loop that goes this way, goes another loop this way. When the brewery opened in the middle of the Civil War, workers literally carved out these caves so they could store their beer kegs. A lot of work. It's, it's massive and there's, there's so many different little openings and, and, and pockets. Um, I can't imagine some of the spaces they were getting themselves into. Under 14 foot ceilings, their beer kept cool in passages that are 56 degrees year round. Depending on what decade they were working in, the ale and booze were stored legally and sometimes illegally. At one point, this part of the cave system ripped underneath the city street all the way to the old inn, but the city eventually blocked it off for safety reasons and to prevent illegal old learning during prohibition. In fact, there were a number of man-made caves under Jordan. This one in particular withstood a landslide in 2010, and 50 years before that, it survived a major flood. Where the light rock and the dark rock meet is actually a water line that shows just how high the floodwaters got during the flood of 1960. 
Strains of the Earth is in the process of adding a wood floor and lights so the public can get a chance to visit this jewel of Jordan's history. Initials in the limestone are a part of the cave's past, but shadows on the wall are a part of its future. We're already in such a cool historical building and this is just another part of that and we want to, you know, open it up, let people know that they can come here. Well, racing season is upon us, and in Candy, Ohio County, there's a track that's dominated by kids. Atwater Speedway is celebrating 25 years with excitement and heavy hearts. Everybody gets itchy about January, so this time of the year, the kids are excited to get going. It's a rite of spring in the town of Atwater. When the weather gets warm, the racers get racing. But at this track, the vehicle of choice is a go-kart. And most of the competition is too young for a driver's license. I'm usually like nervous and excited at the same time. When it's time to go, I get fired up and then go out and race. This youth movement began 25 years ago. That's when Greg Tower and others got the idea to open a competitive go-kart track. They got help from the city and the Lions Club and cleared out a spot on the edge of town. Well, it turned out way bigger than we ever thought it would be. We had our first year we had racers from Thunder Bay, Ontario and Nebraska. Competitors can be as young as five years old and kids are able to sign up for whichever race class suits them best. Oftentimes the entire race is neck and neck. The winners get trophies and sometimes money. It's very competitive, yes. And uh, a lot of our kids have gone on uh, racing stock cars and um, my, my middle son actually, uh, he went on and he worked in the NASCAR industry for 14 years. Small town volunteers fuel these races, but a couple months ago, Atwater lost one of its best. Tasha Fester, a do-it-all volunteer and mother of three young racers, passed away unexpectedly. She was just 33 years old. Tasha was the kind of person that had 30 hours in her day. She got everything done. She took care of it all. She put her all into it. She just loved it. And I mean, racing was their life. Oh, wow. Above all, she was here for her kids, um, cheering them on. She recorded every single one of their races. Indeed, that's Tasha's voice cheering on one of her sons. And that's why Outwater's 25th season will be dedicated to her. When you're coming around the corners, this one's a little bit wider, so you have more grip instead of just coming around with a smaller tire like that. Ten-year-old Tayden Freericks is hoping to take home his first checkered flag after a series of third-place finishes last season. This year. He's going full throttle. Spinning out can get fun, or it depends if you flip, then you're sitting there like this. And it's not very fun. Track maintenance also gets pretty creative, and it takes a village to make it happen. As one of the few remaining go-kart speedways left, the town and its racing families are looking forward to the next 25 years. There's a lot that goes into it that people don't see, and those people really help up, that help step up and pick that up for us and make our job a lot easier. Claws, scales, teeth, and tails, alligators and snakes have taken over the Rad Zoo in Medford. Who's hungry? It's feeding time for Sally and Allie. This is Allie, she's a big girl. And with every bite of chicken comes a fast fact about alligators. She would bite harder than a grizzly bear at this size. Oop, there we go, hey, oh. uh -uh, back up. They got me to move. They are just a couple of the creatures that get your attention at the Reptile and Amphibian Discovery Zoo, also known as RAD. She would easily take my finger if it went in the wrong spot there. Jamie Pastica is the man behind it all. Just giant. He was born in northern Minnesota, but mostly grew up in Florida and became a zookeeper at Animal Kingdom. Anna likes the neck rubs. She does. Then one day, he and his family decided to leave the swamps for the land of 10,000 lakes, and they brought along a few of their friends. The scaly and slimy are our primary focus here, and um, I had gone to reptile gardens when I was six years old. I thought that was the coolest place on earth. From poisonous dart frogs to a green anaconda. They move underwater just like a eel. Nearly 300 creatures of various shapes and sizes live here. Hello! No two are the same, but many have something in common. This is Luis, the boa constrictor. He's 30 years old and eight feet long. And like many of the animals here, he was rescued by the zoo. That includes a call to take Justin Bieber's former pet boa constrictor. Jamie thought it was a prank at first, but it turned out to be very real. One day in December, I got a box 
with a boa, a very chilly boa constrictor in there. I'm like, oh wow. He loves attention. He loves when I'm talking about him. A big part of what they do here is conservation and education. Boa constrictors like to live up in the trees. While the animals take field trips to schools, oftentimes the students visit them. I was like, wow, it's so cool right here. What was your favorite animal? The crocodiles. Oh! Just to see the look on the kid's face when they get to see an animal that they've seen on videos or on YouTube and they get to just hold one. I mean, it's just kind of a cool thing to watch. <laughs> Jamie and his family hope visitors leave with a new appreciation for reptiles and amphibians because for them, work days are always a snap. I'm gonna give her a little, oh. When your dog doesn't want to go to the vet, that's one thing. When your 500 pound alligator doesn't want to go to the vet, it's rodeo day. Native Americans, Swedish immigrants, and even cattle thieves have taken refuge over the years on a spot along the St. Croix River. Nowadays, kayakers and hikers are still drawn to Knapp's Cave. It continues to feel like you're stepping back in time, I think, when you come here. Stepping back in time also means watching your step. I got a tree. It can be a treacherous trek along this part of the St. Croix River but it's also full of unspoiled and unbridled beauty. And what's waiting at the end makes it all worthwhile. It's really hard to see now, but it's, it's right up in there. It's been an attraction. I have letters from the 1920s where people talk about, you know, a picnic up to the cave. So it's been an attraction for a lot of years. Well before it was a place for picnics, Knapp's Cave served as a sort of motel. Archaeologists discovered Native American pottery inside that dates back a couple centuries. There was, you know, obviously tales of, of Indians living or being in this cave. I think it was very much a temporary shelter for them. In the mid-1850s, Swedish immigrants spent winters here, surviving until they could build a permanent log cabin in the spring. There was no place to store a family that happened to arrive in September or October, and so there were a number of families anecdotally, and we know of one, the Johnson family, that would spend the winter here in the cave. Could you imagine that? I've done winter camping, and I wouldn't want to do it for an entire Minnesota winter. But survive they did. There's also evidence that thieves stored their loot here, and sometimes even stolen cattle. Despite centuries of visitors, much of the cave remains a mystery. In recent history, the farthest back anyone has gone is about 150 yards. And as far as we know, no one has ever made it to the very back of the cave. That's because it gets too narrow to explore. Dave Borchert's brother learned that the hard way. He was adventurous and he was trying to get back into an area that he didn't fit into and he got kind of stuck, but he managed to finally squirm his way out. What's likely back there are caverns with plenty of bats and spiders. Knapp's cave is actually named after Oscar Knapp. He was one of the longest running riverboat captains on the St. Croix and was known to bring hunting parties and others to the cave. During that time he was doing the excursions, he was almost an early environmentalist, I think you could, you could say. Um, certainly a steward of the river. The cave is surrounded by private land and the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. So really the only way to get there is to kayak or canoe and then hike up. But those looking for an adventure won't be disappointed. This stretch of the river is really, I think, unique and historic and so incredibly beautiful. Nature abounds here. You guys have always been excellent at sending me your Finding Minnesota ideas. Keep them coming, and if you have another hidden gem I should explore, send it to wccocom contact. Have a great summer, everybody, and thank you for watching.